I want to introduce our epic guest, John Marty. Hey, John. Hey, what's up, Carlos? How you doing, man? Thank you for joining the show. I've been looking forward to interacting with you live. I've seen you a lot, doing a lot of content out there. So I just wanted to catch up and, and learn from your experience. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. So just to get things started, why don't you tell us a little more about your own personal experience? How did you get into product? Yeah, uh, I was uh, a founder for about 13 years. I, I went kind of the opposite direction. I was the founder for 13 years and I got really burnt out in that arena. And so I was looking for something new. And uh, I, I had one company that was not a tech startup by any means. It wasn't a sexy company, you know, when you, when you really think about it. It was a, an electronics business. Think about a mini Best Buy, if you will. And I did that for 10 years. I grew that to a couple million in sales, sold the company to my partner. And then I had this itch to start a, a, a software company. So I took everything that I had. I put all of that money into the software company. And it was essentially a smart home technology company that was like a Google Home or a Alexa, or any of these kind of ecosystem smart home device companies that are out there today that are so easily available. None of that was available when I, when I was doing this. So I saw this interesting market opportunity and I said, great, let me put an ecosystem of products together. I'll uh, put some hardware and software as a package, sell it to architects, sell it to designers in really large city markets. I started in the Miami market. But after about two years of that, really, we just didn't have the infrastructure to keep it going. Uh, and the wireless technology back then didn't work nearly as it nearly as well as it does today. So we kind of take for granted that if you buy the light bulb and you buy the Alexa or you buy the oven, that the oven and the Alexa and the light bulb are all just going to work together. But back then, none of that stuff, all the interoperability standards were not really in place yet. It was just like cutting edge. So the cracks really started to appear. I, I lost everything. So I lost all of my money. I went broke uh, and, and I had to reinvent myself. And so when I was trying to reinvent myself, the first thing I said was, how do I try to become something that feels like a CEO or a founder? but it is within the cocoon of a corporation where I can take money from a golden tree every two weeks and not have to worry about that because I had a baby on the way at the time too, right? So I was looking for comfort and, ex and an experience that married my entrepreneurial spirit. Product management was introduced to me and I said, I have no idea what the hell product management is, but that seems interesting. Let me try to figure out how to do this. I had zero connections, man. I, I was from a little town in Ohio. I had nobody I knew that worked in tech. I knew nobody in Seattle, nobody in San Francisco. So I was like ground level, not having any clue about what to do. I just said, it seems cool. Let me try to figure out how to do it. So my hypothesis was if I get an MBA and go to software development school, maybe I could break into product. And uh, so that journey kind of led me into American Express. And they hired me on as a senior product manager right away. Uh, I, I was surprised they even gave me a shot, to be honest with you, because I had never had experience as a, as a product manager. But I think they liked, they liked the fresh approach that I came at corporate America with, because they were in this reinvention period this digital transformation period. You know, hey, you have so many companies going through digital transformations right now. You imagine a hundred year old company like American Express and they have literally data stores that are real to real tape machines stored away somewhere in the 1970s. And you ask Bobby down the, down the hall, like, hey, Bobby, uh, you've been here for 45 years. You are the glue that holds these tape machines together. How does this programming language work? And Bobby, like, the subject matter expert that if he leaves, the entire company crashes, tells you, <laughs> you know, what's going on. Like, so all these companies are going through this mass massive digital transformation these days. And uh, I think the VP at that time saw me and said, at least he doesn't think like someone in corporate. So anyway, that was the, that was the start into product. And, and from there, 
uh, Amazon called me out of the blue two years later because of my LinkedIn profile. So I didn't even apply for them. They came directly to me. And uh, that's the power of LinkedIn as well. So, Yeah, we, we'll, definitely, we'll definitely talk about that as well in a second. Uh, you, I want to kind of double click on a couple of things that you mentioned about your story, because first of all, I really resonate with that. I, I'm an immigrant coming from Spain, had zero network, no idea about what product management was. I'm an entrepreneur. I, I like how to, to build things. And yeah. at one point, I was also looking for more, even more safety within a context of like creativity. And sure. I finally found my calling. But it's really interesting. And I really appreciate your honesty to really you know show up this way and talk about the things that didn't work and yeah. some of the things that maybe worked. Yeah. So about your own story, you said you started something. And then how do you really get into the system because you said you had no network you were yeah. in ohio and then american express called you. american express is like a solid business and i'm sure they obviously need to do the proper recruiting stuff and you might yeah. need that standard mold at least back in the day so tell me yeah. about that breaking into corporate america yeah so uh, the only thing that i thought at the time was so all I had was that hypothesis. I said, okay, if I do an MBA, I could maybe get a product manager role. But I found that the MBA was too general. And I found that I was actually approaching the job market as a generalist, because that's typically what people do. They approach the job market as a generalist because they're told in school that being well-rounded generalist means you're going to capture the job. And that's not the case. So what I found pretty quickly was I had to recognize that although I have many skills and I, although all of us have many skills, it is, there is a game being played and there's also an efficiency perspective from recruiters. They're going to look at a pile of a hundred resumes and they're going to go, who actually has the title product manager on their resume? Who has actually done these things and that's exactly what we need. Like we don't have time to parse through people's backgrounds that are multifaceted and figure out what to do with you. We just want to put you into the pipeline. We have quota. We got to meet quota. Like let's figure it out. So I, I figured that out quickly. And I said, okay, I'm going to put a stake in the ground and, and call myself product manager. And I'm going to tailor everything on my resume to the words product manager. I use the keywords, prioritization, user stories, all of those things. And I drew from my entrepreneurial background. So even though I, I drew from it, I didn't cloud my resume or my story that I communicated to others with a narrative that was anything other than product. And that really, that really helped. So that started kind of getting me some interviews. In uh, you know, in Boulder, at some of the you know smaller tech startups that I was you know that I was admiring at the time, and uh, but when I was at the software development school, I was networking like crazy, and they had companies coming in. One of the companies that came in was American Express, and I, I remember on that day I was like, I gotta, I'm gonna dress up real nice, I'm gonna tuck my shirt in, I'm not gonna wear shorts today, <laughs> you know. And I, I approached them, and because they were, they were coming at, they were coming from the angle of we're looking for developers, and I said, would you be interested in entertaining the idea of of me coming on as a product manager? I think I can deliver a lot based on my entrepreneurial background, but I kept the narrative in that silo. And it was, it was almost instantaneous. They were like, sure, we'll connect you right away. This seems great. Um, I had, a, I had a, uh, an interview with the uh, VP and, the, and, and a couple of the directors. And w within a few weeks, I, I got an offer letter. So, um, you know, I think one of the things that helped me at that time, too, is since I didn't know really the true official language of product at that time. Like I, I knew the language of trying to do my own startup, but that was super scrappy, right? It wasn't like real product. I said, okay, I'm going to do a two-day certification. And so I took a uh, mountain goat software. There's, you know, a guy that's does these two-day scrum certifications. Um, and I said, okay, I'm going to do it. It was like $1,200 at the time. So it's totally worth it. Two days I was there. I learned all of the, uh, keywords, user stories, prioritization, and that stuff. And I had that book open while I was on the phone screens with these hiring managers. And I'm like, yeah, so 
I've been doing prioritization and user stories. And I'm like, I'm just calling out keywords. <laughs> and they're yeah. like, oh, yeah, this guy really knows what he's talking about. And I had no idea what I was talking about. But it's, you know, it's very interesting because was obviously there was no product school back in the day when, when I decided to start a product no. school. I really resonated. Someone told me the story of like, you have to go to business school. Yeah. And then, then a big company will give you a job. And yeah. You have to be a generalist. And then yeah. these days now when I sit on the other side of the table trying to hire people, it's just so not true these days. No, it's like, so not true, man. I look for skills. I look for... I, I, I specialist. Look for, so 100%. Yeah. Even in a generalist role, some people might think that product is generalist role. Yeah. Still, we want to know what you built and yeah. who you are and like how you write and some other specific things. Like yeah. whatever we studied 10, 15 years ago, it's, it's an anecdote. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree. It's fascinating, right? I mean, you, all these nuances. And it's, yeah. it's interesting too that, you know, you get a four-year degree and you don't, it's, it, it's so fascinating that the career center for universities is often totally disconnected from the university programming. And it's a political battle too. I've talked to a lot of career centers. They're like, we would love to add our career services to the curriculum, but we would be murdered by the, by the teachers, right? So, so, so then, you know, the students have to take that initiative themselves and take it as extracurricular. But the reality is so much of your education is actually about how to do all these things that you need to do to get the job. And students don't get taught that stuff. Yeah. And also, if you think about these career centers, th their incentives are sometimes different than the students' incentives. Very much. Very much. The way they get funded is by raising money from within. Right. Don't, I don't think they have a variable component or bonus based on how many students you actually place. Like, no. No. If your next year's budget was, was contingent on like how well you do your job, right. I think it's a very different story. And also like sometimes I was part of, I, I went to that career center once. Right, right, right. <laughs> and I was like, I want to work in tech. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. And here's the person who's going to show you how to work in tech has never worked in tech in yeah. life. Yeah. Fantastic. So, yeah. and by the way, in my program was a two year full time. There wasn't a single subject. Yeah. Forget about product management. I know. I know. Digital I know. marketing, UX yeah. design, no. data, and that's not really that new, you know? <laughs> I know. And it's true. It's true because you think about the field of product management, it's not really that new. It's really not new. But yet, no schools have programs for product. It's amazing to me. Well, obviously, the reason why you've grown so fast and, and, and why you've captured such an audience is because of the fact that there is such a need in the market. Yeah, and I have to say, it wasn't really that obvious when I started, like six years ago. Yeah. It was the, the boom of coding boot camps. Mm. And a lot of people would ask me, but is this a coding thing? Why yeah. don't you teach coding? And I do not trust me. Not every single tech job is about yeah. coding. And I yeah. have a coding background. Yeah. And, you know, I respect, of course, and I know it's important, but yeah. who else is going to? design, sell, market, take care of people. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's so funny too. Everybody asks me, they're like, well, John, don't you need a technical background to work at Amazon or Google or Facebook? And it's like, no, mm -hmm. there's sales just like at any other company. There's marketing just like at any other company. There's product, you know, there's product management and most product managers don't even have to be technical. A hundred percent. I think that was one of the biggest myths we had to fight, especially at the beginning, because yeah. uh, still, especially in Silicon Valley, a lot of companies were thinking that, okay, you need to be a former engineer. And now it's not the case anymore. No. And I'm glad to see that because it really democratizes access to opportunity. I agree. And as you said, like you were able to, obviously you did a lot of things in your life that, that led you to where you are, yeah. but you were also hungry enough to take a two day course and also treat yourself as a product, position yourself in a way that another person could understand. And of course, it's up to you to deliver. But I think that you were able to continue learning. And I, that's something that I, I always, I love personally, and I encourage people because these days you don't have to quit your job or stop your life just to invest in yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. And it's interesting too, you know, uh, it's an interesting segue into the topic of what type of skills that a product manager really needs because a product manager at the end of the day just needs extreme ownership and a mindset that they're going to figure it out. Right. And that, that's how I got 
that's how I figured out the steps required to even understand how to get in the door because nobody taught me how to get in the door. There was no product school when I started. Everything was, how on earth do I even start? And just data points. What do you do? Oh, you do this? Oh, that's kind of like product management. What do you do? Oh, you're kind of a project, product manager. Great. Let's learn from you. Right? Oh, a little snippet online article piecing together bricks of information to finally get to a point where you're like, oh, this is how to do it. So, and that's exactly what product requires you to do. You're dumped into a situation where you have no idea what's going on. And somebody says, you own this. And you go, great, I own this. And you have to figure it out. Yeah, and, and I think you did something very well at the beginning, which is calling yourself a product manager yeah. and feeling comfortable with it, even though yeah. maybe you didn't have an official job before um, uh, American Express. Right, no title. But, right, that title, because it's not about all the stuff that you know in, in your own world. It's mm -hmm. also like a recruiter who might be hiring for many other positions. They also need to check certain boxes. They have to check the boxes, yeah. Even without those keywords, maybe you wouldn't have the chance to even explain nope. who you are. And, and even, even from the keyword perspective to how I translated that into communication with a recruiter over a 30 minute conversation with the hiring manager after that first call with the rest of the team, right? It's, you know, the resume, it's, it's funny. It's like, when I look at someone's resume now, I can very quickly tell if they're going to fail in an interview or not because of their lack of clarity or extreme clarity on that document. Is it concise? Are your bullet points data driven? Are you leading with achievement? All of these things, most people are writing a resume and they're going, I'm really proud of my achievements and I'm detail oriented and action oriented. And you go, you've been in the industry for 10 years and you cannot articulate one thing on a single page document in size 12 font that you've done, that you're proud of. That's most people. It's, it, it's really fascinating. Actually, John, I found you on LinkedIn just because of your own personal brand and yeah. the content that you put out there on, on product and so on. Yeah. And I actually didn't even know where you studied or anything like that because I'm, I was more focused on what you've built. And right. your, your own online presence speaks for, it, for itself, at least thanks, for that first um, connection. So yeah, thanks, man. I, I can't emphasize that enough because you know we work with a lot of Spiding PMs out there who are amazing. Yeah. Um, they don't need to start from, from scratch. You said your first PM job was actually a senior PM. Yeah. So at, at, at 31. At 31. Which is which is great. It's like not everyone has to be an associate PM. Like no. there's a lot of stuff you've done, maybe with a different name, yeah. but that it counts towards the requirements of a senior PM or more. That's right. So that's right. I also want to ask, uh, answer the question for the uh, for the audience. The, yeah, sure. the title here: You're a senior PM at Amazon and founder of Project One B. You're a founder, first yeah. of all. So I should have put that first. So yeah, yeah. Tell me more about that. That each that you have to continue building things. Yeah. So I, it's, I'm a lot more particular about building something now than I was in the past. So my entrepreneurial journey started with. Uh, I want to build anything to be an entrepreneur. It didn't matter what it was. It could be a trash service, right? Just something that I could say that I built. And so I, I went through that process for 13 years. But what I realized is, you know, I got burnt out very, very quickly. And I started to explore why I got burnt out. And it just wasn't deeply connected to my personal story. I also, I hadn't developed as a person enough yet in my 20s. My frontal lobe, you know, your frontal lobe, nobody's frontal lobe really develops until you're 34, 35 years old, right? That's when you're, you're starting to kind of have more perspective and more reason. And, you know, when I, when I started to get in my 30s, I was gaining more perspective and the failure helped me, you know, get to that point as well. But I think that now a lot of people come to me and they go, they want to, they want to start a company. And the first thing I do is I ask them why, because there's a lot of myths in the industry. They think that they're going to make more money and have more freedom as a founder. And in most all cases, that's not true. There is no freedom when you are an entrepreneur, right? You're working seven days a week. You're, you're 
always on. You have tons of employees. You have mouths to feed. If they're not getting paid, you have to take from your paycheck and give to them, right? Or else they're going to leave and you need that support. You always got to focus on your team. So it's, it's an intense weight of stress that people find themselves in when they get into that environment. They go in with rose-colored glasses, they get into the environment and go, oh my God, this is not what I was expecting. I was expecting freedom, but freedom doesn't come. Right? I think there's far more freedom in corporate America working in tech. I can fail on a project and I'm still getting paid. There's a lot of freedom. Right? I have vacation days. My email does not turn on at all during the weekends. I am totally free. Right, So there's all these benefits in corporate, but people poo-poo it and they say, well, I just want to be a founder. So circling back to the, the, you know, the, the core of why I talked about this is that when I think about being a founder now, I think about the importance of making it rooted in your personal story because you can't start an entrepreneurial venture for the money. You can't. You have to start an entrepreneurial venture for the meaning, for something that's connected to you. Because as Simon Sinek says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Or they buy why you do it. So if I was a founder for a company and I go, I sell books, people would be like, why do you sell books? It's the first question anybody asks you when you're a founder of a company. Why do you do it? <laughs> you go, well, I I can make a shitload of money. It's, well, really? Can you? Like, are, are you going to be free? So the qualifier for me or for anybody who's watching, if you're trying to be a founder, the thing that you should be asking yourself is, does this project or thing give me a sense of meaning? And could I do it even if I wasn't making the money? If, the, if your answer is yes, then you should absolutely jump into creating a startup because is it, is it, it is going to be a massive grind more so than you've ever experienced in your life. If you think you work hard in corporate now, you have no idea how hard you're going to be working as an entrepreneur and you're going to get paid far less money for a large number of years until maybe you make it. That's the reality, you know? So, um, so I think that's the recommendation for, for, for most people who are trying to get into it. And that's why I'm going after Project 1B, because Project 1B is a deeply meaningful project for me. It's a not-for-profit. It's all about converting the chase in school that we learn early on in our lives, a chase for happiness, which is actually connected to a chase for money. There's a direct correlation. So I say happy, what I actually mean in my brain is money. And I mean maximizing money as much as possible, because if I don't, I'm not going to be as happy and I'm not going to have as meaningful a life. But Project 1B is meant to switch the script for individuals in schools and individuals in, in their careers into a chase for the word meaning as opposed to the word happiness. Because if you chase the word meaning, you wind up coming to better questions in your life. And better questions lead to better answers. And I think there's a very strong correlation between being a founder or an early, early employee at a startup and also then becoming a product manager or vice versa. I don't think there is, yeah. uh, I don't know what the right order is. We've seen a lot of founders who end up joining large organizations as product people. Yeah. I've seen a lot of product people in large organizations that at some point they decide yeah. to build something for themselves because I think yeah. that concept of building yeah. is what keeps you fired up. And then you can decide if you want to build for yourself or for somebody else. And another thing yeah. that I think it's important for, for the audience to recognize is that I don't think it's an either or type of answer where yeah. you're either a full-time founder or you're either a full-time PM. You are a clear example of that. You, are, you have a full-time job at Amazon and then you also have a project on the side. And that's yeah. legit. And I think that's a good way to test the waters. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, I feel like it's the, the safest way to do it. Uh, oftentimes there's this pull to say, but if only I could do this thing full time, you know, it might be more fulfilling. But you have to kind of layer in a little bit of perspective and say, what, what happens if it really is full time? The money is not nearly as consistent, right? There's, there's, um, it's not, the grass is never as green as you think it's going to be, right? Which is why I think it's important for people, and it's hard to do. I think it's important to follow two tracks. I really do. I've 
I've consistently followed two tracks for years. I have one passion project on the side that I'm always working on. And then I have my day job as well. And there's elements of my day job that are amazing, that are super fulfilling, right? And then elements of my day job that are not so fulfilling. That's life, right? There's elements for you. People people look at you and say, entrepreneur, amazing. He probably has like everything he'd ever wanted in life. And yet the reality is there are ups and downs of every day, right? A thousand percent, John. <laughs> yeah, man. You know? It's actually a, a highlight of my my day of my, my career to be able to share world stories with, with people that I like at the end of the day. Because when nobody's looking and the doors are closed and everyone's grinding, then it's a lot of stress for, for everyone. I don't want to diminish anybody. But no, of course. being a founder, it's not as fun as uh, some magazines make you think. Yeah, which is why it has to be meaningful to you, right? Because that gets you through uh, the, the, the times where you feel low. You say, but you know what? This is deeply meaningful. I have to keep going. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, why did I start the product school? And, and I always answer, this is a solution to my own problem. This is yeah. learning in me. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I'm your own itch. to go to business school. And yeah. I realized that wasn't for me. Yeah. Or I went to engineering and I didn't want to code. And yeah. why nobody there told me, hey, kid. No worries. Yeah. We'll leverage that in a different way. Like maybe if someone had told me I would be doing something else, but I think yeah. that that type of fire and um, is what drives me to continue doing what I do because you just do like a rational analysis of your money potential and your jobs and whatnot. Who knows? Maybe you know you. I would chase the short term win, yeah. but it wouldn't be as fulfilling or meaningful as as I think this is. Not yeah. always, but most of the time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I love the mission that you're on too because it's really disruptive to traditional education, right? I think education is one of these things that it's so core to yeah. everything and it's so related to happiness, wealth, yeah. health, and right. many other things that I don't want to convince people of like, okay, you, this, if you want to become a PM, do you have to go to pro school? No. no. But when someone, the same way when someone asks me, hey, should I do this program? I'm like, Great. What's the alternative to eat donuts watching Netflix? Then absolutely learn something, read a book. Like I'm all for sure. learning. I will take you in a in a in a journey. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just gives people an alternative path, right? It's somebody could say, Well, I could I could go to product school and I could learn the skills that I need to get a job right away, or I could go to a four-year university and I might have one class, if I'm lucky, on product management over a four-year period. There's, there's trade-offs with either scenario, right? If you, you land in a top school and it's a feeder in Amazon or Google, great, more power to you. But then you're shouldering $180,000 in student loan debt. Okay, fine. If, but if you're making 250, 300 out of your first job, amazing. It's just everything is a ROI. Everything is return on investment. Yeah, and I think in that on that topic, there is such a discrepancy between top tier universities and and everything else. Oh, I totally agree. Cost is relatively similar, but the ROI is so different yeah. than I really have something against. Like when people ask me, who are your competitors? My competitors are not other startups. I think we're all trying to build a better future, right? Yeah, right, right. My competitor, my real enemy, is yeah. a second or third year university who's taking advantage of people, putting yeah. them in debt, and really not delivering on what they are promising. Yeah, yeah, I think I, yeah, I lo I love talking about this topic too because I, as a student going into a university or an MBA right, in an MBA program, there's this kind of inherent feeling that a lot of people get, uh, and they don't like thinking about it. Otherwise, they think, well, if I go to this school, I'm going to be taken care of. It's almost like this maternal uh, perspective that they get on school, right? Like I'm going to be taken care of and uh, I'm going to learn the skills that I need. And really, no, uh, you're not going to have any skills when you graduate. You're going to be a generalist uh, and you won't know how to do your day job at all when you first start. And that's that's really scary, um, you know, you have this kind of paternal feeling like I'm going to be taken care of. And then you hit the real world and go, oh my God, I'm not prepared at all for this. What did I just go to school for? So I, I, I hope that some of these discussions that we are having can inspire some people just to think yeah. nobody has the right answer, but there's that, there are definitely more options. And I think that's something yeah. I was craving as a full-time student uh, in Europe 
that yeah. someone told me just one version of the story and I was just following it blindly. Yeah. You know, yeah. that critical thinking and just having access to people, to opportunities, to resources yeah. is what makes you create your own version of it. And the good news, I think, in general is that all of, a lot of this stuff is actually free and it's on you to it go is. out there and, and just to grab it. It is. It is. Yeah. I, I look at everything now as just a single data point, right? If I, if I, if I seek someone's advice, I don't say that's the gold standard. I say that's a data point. That's his or her perspective. Very interesting. Note taken. I talk to you. Very interesting. Note taken. And I formulate my own opinion based on a number of different things that I've, I've gathered. So what's uh, new? What's what the future look like for you? Again. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, so uh, you know, definitely going to continue with Project 1B. The, the, the first layer of Project 1B is to interview top individuals who people admire, you know, well-known individuals who people admire, who have gone through major failures in their life, right? Because I want someone to see the episode and go, or just see the cover art and go, I admire that person. And then hear the story and recognize that, well, they spent 20 years going through hell to get where you now admire them. So there's not glamour. I want to I wanna kind of break down these glamorous barriers that we see on the surface and have people understand like, yeah, everybody goes through crazy stuff in life. Like everybody has struggles and problems and, you know, here's how this individual overcame it. Here's how this, th here's the path this person took or just provide those different perspectives and scale the topic, the true topic of like happiness, meaning, fulfillment, you know, overcoming fear. Um, and so that, that's like the real passion project for me. Like if, if I was going to step out, um, I would step out in another, that arena full force and, um, and then ultimately collate all of that content into something that I can deliver as curriculum and as an enterprise model. Because I think the biggest problem in corporate America that a lot of people face is there's so much ego involved, right? There's so much ego. There's so much jockeying for position, um, a lot of backstabbing, things like that. This is at every company. But this is across the board. And I think the thing that's missing in corporate training is that nobody's breaking down why that stuff is happening. The reason why it's happening is everyone's jockeying for dollar signs and position because position and dollar signs mean I have a valuable life. I am more valuable. I should be valued in society, right? It's all a self-esteem play that, that, that people are chasing essentially. And if, if, if you just recognize that simple fact, then people would operate far more humble in a corporate environment. So anyway, that's like, that's like the broader mission, really like change the, change the framework that people think um, so that they can just be, just live more meaningful lives in the positions that they're already in. Cool. Well, um, with this, I, I want to wrap up the interview. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, to yeah man. Jonah, how can people find you? Uh, so I'm on LinkedIn all the time. You can follow me on LinkedIn. Um, creating posts every day over there, uh, it, engaging with the community in, in the comments like crazy and, and, and you know, private messages that come through all the time. I try to get to as many as I can. And uh, and, and then a YouTube, is ch a YouTube channel as well. Just uh, John Marty. Pretty easy to find. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Take care. Thanks a lot, man.